everybody, and welcome to Under the Forelock. I'm Betsy Billhorn, and today we have Dr. Heather Azeman as a guest on our show. She is a occupational therapist who also comply, uh, combines hypotherapy. There's a lot of big words here, so just bear with me for a second. So she's an occupational therapist who combines hypotherapy um, in her practice, working with adults and children. She has her own private practice called Play and Prosper Therapy in New Hampshire. Uh, she works with both children and families using a relationship-based approach uh, in incorporating that, that equine movement with the hippotherapy, but also farm environment, nature, and play into those therapy sessions. Uh, a little more credentials for, for Dr. Heather. She uh, also is a DIR floor time advanced certified provider and a hippotherapy clinical specialist, has also uh, sat on the board of Scientific Advisory Council for Horse and Human Research Foundation, and previously also served as a research chair for the American Hippothe, uh, uh, American Hippothe Associated. Wow, that's a lot. It's a lot of clinical stuff. <laughs> I'm very qualified <laughs> to speak on this topic. Uh, so Heather, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi, all right. So we're, uh, um, I'm really curious, right? I think a lot of people know about equine assisted therapy or equine experiential learning. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's a lot of these um, uh, hypotherapy, like the a lot of people volunteer, uh, to, you know, for, for some of these. But can you talk a little bit more about um, occupational therapy and hypotherapy together? Because I, I think that's not something that people are aware of. The sure. Go together. Okay. There's a bit to talk about with that. Yeah, First, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people typically don't know what occupational therapy is, which I'm probably just going to refer to OT the remainder of the time. It's a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but a lot of people are like, what is OT? Because, um, you know, there's physical therapy that kind of addresses a lot of the movement. Um, and so we're, so I'll primarily address it from a child perspective, just because that's primarily the, what the population I work with. But it's same for adults. Um, but for physical therapists, they work on your ability to like walk and do other type of movement, uh, task and how that impacts their daily, you know, engagement, moving through space. Um, a lot of people know speech therapists work on language, um, and communication. And they also work on obviously, um, cause language is also tied to some of that cognition piece as well. Um, so everyone's like, what is OTs, you know, cause like, what are you like teaching me to do a job, which obviously is not what it is. Or people go, Oh, are you occupying a country? You know, <laughs> so, so it's neither of those, but um, basically occupations from occupational therapy just means all your daily routines that you engage in. So occupational therapists help you work on your, whatever is impacting your ability to engage in your daily routines and working on ways to, you know, either developmentally help you reach those milestones or um, adapt ways to be able to engage in those routines. So if you think about kids in this perspective, like kids daily routines, occupations per se was primarily playing. Obviously there's the learning piece too, which is addressed more in the schools. Um, some of the ability to take care of themselves. So self-care, dressing, bathing, those pieces, feeding, um, and then socially engaging with peers. And then there's also, you know, how is that impacted? So are the kids having fine motor challenges, gross motor challenges? Um, are there sensory systems, like all their sense in the body impacted that helps them understand their world around them? Um, is there some social pieces impacting it? Are there emotional pieces impacting it? So forth. So gotcha. that's the first part. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> that's a lot right there. Therapy. <laughs> yeah. So that, yeah. that, um, um, and I'll get into like the whole, we'll go into other pieces later about some more of that. Cause I bet you have a lot of questions about that, yeah. but kind of just breaking up a bit into then incorporating courses into practice. So obviously for OT, you have to go to school, you know, school for that. So right now it's a master's degree or option of doctor degree. That's why I have my doctorate because I did the doctorate degree. <laughs> uh, I did some research with that. Um, but in order to then use hypotherapy as an OT, PT, or speech language pathologist, um, you then do additional trainings in it. Um, but kind of, we'll go back to that in a minute. Um, it's a whole web of things. But um, so I think what really needs to 
people need to kind of get confused about a bit, I guess would be the best way to say it is like, what is hippotherapy? What is therapeutic riding? What is the difference between all these pieces? Um, and that's where I think the confusion lies. Um, the terminology is unfortunately confusing. Um, so hippotherapy is a confusing term because people are like, what in the world are you doing with hippopotamus? <laughs> it's like, <Exactly. laughs> so, um, so hippo is actually the Greek word um, for horse. And it was in the 1980s, a bunch of therapists from the U.S. actually went over to Germany. And in Germany, they called it hippotherapy. Um, and so they came back to the U.S. and started implementing it as an approach to use for therapists. Um, so basically you have hippotherapy which can be used by a, a licensed therapist being otpt or speech language pathologist um and then you have therapeutic routing which is confusing because people think it's therapy and of course the horse is therapeutic to you know anybody in any means but therapeutic routing is typically um well it is i should say um it is what i I like to say as well as the American Hippotherapy Association really backs the idea of it's really adaptive riding. So like you have adaptive okay. skiing, adaptive swimming, so forth. So it's teaching people with this, you know, disabilities, different, you know, different differences, learning needs, so forth, how to learn to ride the horse. Um, and of course the horse is, has all these wonderful aspects to it that is going to be beneficial. Like you and me realize that when we ride the horse, like it definitely helps our bodies. It definitely helps our mind. It definitely helps our spirit. Um, but the people that are teaching people in therapeutic riding are riding instructors who have experienced riding horses, just learning, you know, different ways to work with people with disabilities, just like special education teachers or teachers that just right. know how to work with people with, um, different learning differences and there is a little bit of a heated debate about it because um a lot of people that are not therapists that do therapeutic routing like to claim that it is a different type of therapy and so forth um but the importance of the language is really necessary in order for therapists to actually get insurance reimbursement and kids to actually benefit from getting services so that's my whole spiel <laughs> on that. <laughs> and then just to kind of clarify a little bit more of some of that other equine assisted therapy pieces, there also is some of the mental health pieces, which I'm not going to talk a lot about. Um, but if you are a licensed mental health provider, so a social worker, uh, mental health counselor, a psychologist, so forth, um, you can do like uh, equine uh, facilitated psychotherapy and other types of equine assisted therapy. Um, whereas like the ex equine like experiential learning and so forth, again, is the same thing of like, instead of being on the horse, it's like ground stuff done with people doing learning experiences that aren't, you know, certified therapists. So so there's a whole broad spectrum, right? Yes. And yes, yes. yeah, because I, I volunteered for ther therapeutic writing um, a, a while ago. And now that you've mentioned the difference, I was, you know, because I remember, yeah, it was, we, we had, you know, mostly children, but also adults come and we were just teaching them how to ride. And I don't recollect any specific um, program as far as, oh, well, the therapist was coming in and saying, you know, do this motion or do this or do that. Yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, there was definitely, you could see a huge difference in, especially with, I think some of the more, uh, um, and I'm, I'm probably gonna use the wrong terminology, but, you know, some of the adults and the children that were, um, I think, uh, had more emotionally disturbed or had, were on the spectrum, right. Were, were much more open, um, and, and really enjoyed that. But, uh, I had no idea that there was beyond that, that there was actually a therapy, yeah. right. That, you know, you had a, a treatment plan and you were working through that and that horse was a part of that. So, exactly. yeah. So what is the difference? I mean, because when I was, you know, I volunteered, I, I didn't teach. I was one of the people that, you know, we walked along the side and offered a lot of encouragement. Um, but so talk to me about how the hippotherapy works. I mean, obviously there's, you, you work with the, the child or the family on a treatment plan, right? And you have yeah. a kind of a roadmap. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's a really different thing. Like when the therapy grinding, cause I don't, you know, cause I think people get confused. It's like they, there are some, which I have mixed feelings about. They make some goals related to riding related goals, but 
I mean, in a regular riding program, you're not going to, you know, you just, I mean, it's kind of nice because I mean, it's good to have goals, but I think the blinds get blurred because sometimes they'll play like games and stuff and it looks like therapy, like the games that I might be doing with my clients, but it's like very different because the way it works for a kid coming in for OT or even PT or speech is that, I mean, I primarily work through insurance companies. I, um, so I, I have to do all the fun stuff of getting authorization from the insurance company, verifying benefits, all that fun stuff if needed. But then they come in for initial evaluation um, where we don't use the horse at all. Um, and we just do all standardized testing or um, what they call clinical observation. So like observing the kid in their environment, having them do different play activities, so forth, interviews with the parents, so forth. Um, and then I get the fun process of writing up a huge uh, evaluation report. Um, but the great part is then we work with the families to create goals that are kind of family centered around what they want to work on their kid and also some areas that we're deciding that we kind of want to work on. Um, and the big thing personally I take too is I take a strength based approach. So I look at, okay, these might be some of their challenges, but let's use the strengths and likes to that what are things they like to then work on those areas that are, you know, either developmentally they seem behind with it or they need adaptations to kind of get through their daily routines. Um, so then in each session, we then use those goals to kind of guide our session. So if I see a kid say for an hour, which is about the average length of a session, um, they'll come in and we'll usually spend the first part of the session on the horse. Um, depending on the kid, um, we will use the horse's movement to help with gross motor skills. So we'll have the horse stop and go and they'll work on their balance. We'll get different positions. And I think to the horse world, it's kind of looks like they're doing some vaulting. So, but we call them developmental positions. So we do like hands and knees, um, which is basically like the positioning child needs for crawling. Um, we'll do some changing direction facing backwards but we'll do it for them to actually integrate like what they're visually seeing from a different perspective um and then we will do changes in direction we'll use lots of figures to kind of challenge the balance um some of my kids um will do some like modified standing so they'll do partial standings to work on balance uh, my kids with more sensory needs especially kids that have an um, autism diagnosis we will do um lots of um lots of different movement patterns to kind of just help them keep their bodies regulated um more of my other kids will get on the horse and we'll do some visual activities so we'll bring some like ball catching games on the horse um, while the horse is stopping and going so they could visually plan um, we might, um, I have some kids working on some higher language, you know, um, higher, higher cognition based activities. So we might even, you know, do some obstacle courses, not even on the horse, but like leading the horse through obstacle courses to work on some of that planning. Um, and then with my kids that have more emotion based things, I actually bring out some of my horses that are a little more sass to them mm -hmm. um and we'll kind of work on just body awareness and reading like you know how the horse responds to their body you know and kind of reflecting on their body emotions and how their body shows it how the horse shows it so forth um and then you know then we kind of follow up with things off the horse as well so um we have acres and acres of forests and fields and so forth. So I take my kids out and we'll do a lot of play activities out there. We have creeks we have. So we just kind of do like things that you would see kind of more in the clinic, but like in an outdoor setting. Um, and in the winter, of course, we have an indoor space as needed to do some of those things. Yeah, I was going to say hopefully, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so where do you, um, well, I have a ton of questions, but I, I think the first question is, you know, you, you're putting together a plan with the, with the family, right? And there are certain goals. Um, so it's not necessarily that when a family or uh, a patient comes to you for occupational therapy that 
it's assumed that you're going to be doing things with horses, right? Yeah. Is there, is there a decision-making process there about when we bring in the hippotherapy and when we don't? Absolutely. Yeah. So I have, I mean, I'll be honest, most families do come to me because they see the horse piece. Yeah. Um, but then that varies a lot. Some of my kids will qualify for twice a week and then the families will realize that, oh, it's beneficial for us to do home health or in this day and age, telehealth. Um, you know, so we can work on following up with some things at home. Um, I had some kids do the horse for some time and they, you know, there was only so much we could do with working on the horse. And then we would transition to a different environment. Um, or I had some families realize that like, yeah, the horse kid just was, it just wasn't the best suited for the kid, whether, you know, we couldn't address a lot of the goals or, you know, a few kids are actually, it's just, they just don't like that environment. Um, and we would turn us into other settings. Um, and I actually have a few families that come for me, not for the horse at all, because I have that floor time training, which is um, yeah. more for kids that have autism diagnosis or social emotional differences. And we work on, you know, more play development. And that's where the families will come for me for that instead. So, so it just, it just, it's very um, tailored to the specific, um, yeah. you know, just like the treatment plan, it's very tailored to the specific, yeah. the child that's coming in. So talk to me a little bit about the horses. So, you know, you said you had some personal horses that are sassy, but I, I think kind of implicit in that was that you had horses who are uh, trained or accustomed. Yeah, so or, even yeah. Sassy horse is just, I mean, a, yeah. AKA she likes to play with the lead rope and make faces type of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Or she'll like, she's a mare that like, if you touch her on the ground, the wrong spot, she'll get a little like nippy. Little but, yeah. other, but other <laughs> than that, I mean, um, I have some transition with horses coming and going because unfortunately age and so forth. Um, but we have, we're really fortunate the farm at, um, I use primarily the owner's horses, um, as well as one of the um, borders horses. So, I mean, I'm using, which is really cool. I get Icelandic horses to use. Um, oh, wow. which is awesome. They're fabulous. Um, and then I have uh, an appendix. Um, I, had a Shet I had a Shetland cross, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, he passed away recently. Um, and then I had a Chingati pony that I was using. Um, but we only use her for more ground-based activities um, just because she's better for the body awareness pieces and so forth. She prefers not to go in the therapy sessions. Interesting. So, so you have to do some observation because you know, you're know you using a boarder's horse, you're using the owner's horse. So what are the qualities that you're looking for when, when you're picking these horses? <laughs> yeah. So the biggest thing, which many people don't realize, is the horse needs to be sound. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people, when they go, I mean, and I'm not... I don't classify myself as a program because the client was of a program, not a program, I'm a, a therapy clinic, but more of these like riding, adaptive riding therapy, riding programs will get a lot of donations. Ours is obviously in my settings very different, but um, the horses have to be sound. They have to also have what we call, which is a little bit different than the dressage world. There's some terms that are a little bit different. They talk about a symmetrical walk, which basically is the ability to track up evenly on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and then the horse has to be able to be adjustable. So basic dressage components like adjustable in the stride, increase, you know, to lengthen stride, shorten stride, um, has to be able to show a little bit of ability to lift their back when they're being led from the ground. I know that's really hard if you're not doing like long lining or so forth. Um, some horses be long line. These guys, I don't just because their training's different. Um, but they have to be able to, you know, have good gait qualities, adjustable gait qualities. I mean, we may or may not trot, but they have to be sound walk trot canter. Um, or if they're older, obviously, and they don't like, you know, cantering, at least to be able to have a good sound solid walk. Um, and then they have to be pretty much unflappable. Um, so I, um, they have to tolerate screaming, yelling, um, not like many, I mean, my clients don't really hit or kick on the horse, but if they get excited and kick their legs, um, they have to tolerate the kids getting in all different positions. Um, and then I am choosing you know, some horses that they have their own quirks and so forth. So like one horse I can't do ball activities with and that's okay. He doesn't like it. Like that's, you know, um, so one, you know, the three horses I use right now, um, like one is two are very like, steady eddy guys and one is like very forward thinking so the forward thinking one is more for my clients that need more of that 
input to their body and they have good, you know, strength and gross motor skills so they could sit up and maintain their balance on that, but get their other needs. Whereas my other clients that need more of the steady, slow walk can handle the other two better. So. Yeah. And, and how would you, so in the case of, you know, the borders horse, right? So how do you, like, how do you test for that? Or, I mean, how so, do you, you know? know? All three of the horses too. So yeah. basically what needs to be done is, so um, I was fortunate the border is actually an OT. So she kind of knew. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I've asked other boarders before and it just, I knew, I just, from you know, I observed all the horses out there and I know the farm I'm at, like a lot of people like, are interested in the horses going more because as you know, as adults, it's really hard when you're working full time and so forth. So, yeah. um, but this one, um, she just always did a lot of like activities and games and kept him busy. And he's always been very, you know, she had him since she was a child and she did like crazy stuff on him, like jumping off of him and throwing balls and so forth. And like the two Isonics I use now, they used to have a riding, like a kid's riding program and they did crazy games and all this stuff at them. So all these horses were exposed to it, um, which I was very fortunate because usually like if they're not, it takes like months and months and months to train them. Um, so I was just very fortunate these guys had exposure. Um, but it's definitely like they, besides like the good quality gates, you have to make sure that they're like a horse that is okay with running and screaming around them and is okay with the busy environment, um, unpredictable action, so forth. And then I typically do a lot of testing with, I take balls out, pool noodles, like just different things we have sitting around to see their reaction. I expect them to react. I want, I don't want a horse that's not going to react at gotcha. all unless they've done it before, right. but I want to see like a smart reaction. Like if I throw a ball over a horse, I don't want them taking off galloping across the arena, but if they flinch a little bit and then look at it and go to, go to the ball, like that's the response I'm looking for. Um, because they'll learn that, Oh, it's not going to hurt me. Like it's okay if you throw it over me. Um, and then we start, um, we have some kids that I actually, that are riders in the, at the farm that I actually get on and have them do all the positions and we do mock sessions with leading the horse and having side workers poking their elbows in their sides. And I have, I'm practicing not the best leading. So my horses get used to like, they may not, you know, have the most sad. I'm like, I want savvy horse leaders, but every once in a while, like, someone might make an error with the leading and judgment of the horse. So I want to make sure the horse is like, okay with that as well. So, yeah, th that's, that's quite a bit. So in, in your, but in your hippotherapy certification, you talked about a little bit about, okay, training the horse. So in the, in the certification process, did you learn, you know, Hey, this is how we, you know, acclimate or train a horse well, to do the hippotherapy process is actually yeah. interesting. So the American hippotherapy association offers a bunch of courses that's mm -hmm. really a lot of training the whole, the, the, the therapist, so, as well as learning the horse education. So, I mean, I think I was a little fortunate because I grew up around horses and, you know, ride dressage and so forth. So, like, I had the horse experience, um, which actually really helps the therapist because learning it as an adult with no horse experience is a, definitely a lot harder. I see it in the therapist. It's just harder to manage. It's a lot to manage what's going on in the environment. Um, but they teach you a lot about like the basic horse knowledge and care and what you do, what you check for selecting horse for therapy, um, some of the training pieces, so forth. But a lot of their focus is a lot on training the therapist and how to work with the clients and how to grade the horses move in and so forth. Um, but then they have like lots of courses you take as continuing ed. Um, and then there's a separate uh, board called the, gosh, why am I blanking right now? It's AHCB, so the American Hippotherapy Certification Board. There you go, that was easy. Um, <laughs> and they're a different organization that gives the exam, pretty much. You sit for this, like, six-hour, like, at, like, a Prometric or whatever, you know, one of those sites that you take, like, your online, S you know, like, yeah. <laughs> theories, SATs, whatever, however they do that stuff these days, same type of thing. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, they teach you a lot about that. Usually when you run your own practice, it just depends. It's so variable on where you are. Like I'm using, like, I'm not at any like big farm or anything. So I have to do all the work myself, but like, I do go six hours a week down to like a big, what they call path, uh, center, which is like the therapeutic riding centers, the professional association of therapeutic horsemanship international, which used to be NARA. Um, 
and they do all like they do all that so i just literally show up and see kids and then leave type of thing whereas at the other farm like i have, i do all the pieces to make it work so, so you have to set up everything in the arena attack up the horse and, and well and the good thing is i have um horse leaders i did have sidewalkers but obviously with covid right now i'm not using i'm having yeah. family sidewalk but my horse leaders um we ha i run a training session when i get a bunch of new leaders i'm actually having one this week actually for a few more <laughs> Um, and I just, you know, teach them like first show them what the horses we're using, where all the equipment is, um, what type of halter and leading process we use. I teach them, you know, they're not going to be doing the sidewalking, but I teach them all the components. So basically the good thing is I just, I make the schedule, I schedule, you know, my horse leaders, um, but they get the horses, get them ready. So forth for all the sessions and I just treat and then go from there. But Nice. Nice. But so how do you, um, so then there's a question of one of the things that, um, at the therapeutic riding center that I volunteered at, um, you know, there were horses that I think over time get burned out or they, you yeah. know, they, you can see that it's not, not working for them anymore. Right. And so how, how do you recognize those signs? And then is that, is it different for every horse where, you know, or do they get rotated out like, hey, six months is a good amount of time and they need a break or, you know, how does, how does that work from that perspective? No, I think with the farm that I'm at by myself at my friend's facility, it's a little bit different. I think mm -hmm. in the bigger centers, um, yeah, they do get burnt out. Um, a lot of them, um, you know, it wasn't, it's not their first career. It's kind of like they're, they're retired into it. So yeah. it's a little bit hard for them because they used to be these big, you know, some of them are, I mean, I'm, it depends on the location, but some places that like when I was at, they were like big show horses prior or like a personal kid horse. So it's a lot harder because they have different people doing stalls daily, they have different people handling them and so forth. Um, those facilities do typically, I think the one I'm at, um, that's a big, you know, therapeutic riding center, they do, um, they do like six, seven weeks on then two weeks off, six, seven weeks on, so forth. Um, but it's really hard on my clients because, you know, it's no consistency. I mean, we're still doing home visits in between, but it's just, we're not getting the consistency of therapy from that mm. perspective. Um, and I know they try to ride their horses here and there and they do a really good job with it, but it's just really hard with a larger facility. Whereas I'm at, like, these horses have always been kids' horses per se, they were right. in some sort of lesson program prior. Um, they also have either a leasey or the owners riding them. So, um, so they're fit. They're very fit. I mean, these horses are either doing dressage work or they're going on, you know, two to four tr hour trail rides multiple times a week on days I'm not using them. Um, so they're very, you know, when they go in my sessions, they're like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's almost like a break, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Cause yeah. they have a lot of variety mentally what, yeah. what's going on. Yeah. And they really like yeah. it. Um, my guys, I don't see a lot of burnout, but that's because they're just being used for OT sessions, incorporating hypotherapy rather than doing some OT and hypotherapy, then PT and hypotherapy. And then some independent riding and then driving like there's a lot you know whereas this is like this is what they this is their job and it's been their like this is you know like some horses are dressage horses some horses are like these guys train like they're trained to be hypotherapy horses so gotcha. it's just very different um plus they i mean i'm very particular like they go at most two times in one day which means they're going an hour so <laughs> yeah i was just about to ask you that yeah. like you know how you know how often and and how do you the manage standards that yeah. are, like try not to use more than three max four t four times a day depending if they're half an hour or 40 minutes or hour sessions obviously if an hour you won't use four times a day but um because my ot sessions are an hour but we're on the horse for only about half that time sometimes a little bit longer but they're not going for more than like an hour, an hour and 15 minutes with a break in between a day. So nice. nice. And it's about 24 seven, all them. So, Oh yeah. So they get the whole, yeah, yeah they really get to, to kind of chill out and relax. So question for you, um, as far as, you know, so the clients you're, you're doing OT, um, do you, 
I mean, do they, do they bond to a particular horse? They have a preference for a particular horse? Uh, you know, do you change horses? Yeah, or, so that's you know? a good question. So, yeah. it, um, I definitely, um, when I evaluate a kid first, in the back of my mind, I think about, okay, I have these three horses I primarily use you know, Herser, I'll just name names, it's just easier. So Herser mm -hmm. is my little, um, legit brown, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, brown Icelandic. Um, and he is just like, your cool dude. Like he's completely unflappable, except if he use a red ball. So we don't use red balls. Um, he thinks they're going to eat him. Um, he like, he's a horse that like, he won't even like eat, try to get him like, cause they told obviously the Icelandic. So like, and he's trained to trot, but he won't even like tote. He does like this walk thing. Like, <laughs> so like I could basically put like, and, but despite him being lazy, he tracks up really nicely. And that's what I love about the Icelandics is that they're, they're overreaching their step and their stride is really nice, even if they're not forward. <laughs> so, which is great. Um, so he, um, so I could put my kids, I have put a kid on him that has no head control and we have like, all hands on deck, like supporting her head up when we have like three to four boppy pillows built up. So just service to put her arms on. Um, I have a lot of my kids that um, have an, you know, autism diagnosis and we will um, put them on him first. Um, but he's also my smallest one at like 13 hands. So I had to pay attention to that. Um, the appendix I use, Rudy, is pretty much unflappable like him as well. Um, so my kids, when they start growing, then I put him on him. Um, but he also has a lot bigger, you know, a bigger walk too. So right. if I'm ready to move up to something, I put them on him. Um, and then whereas like, um, I have Tactor, I have all these fun names. Um, he's also an Icelandic, but he's bigger. He's more closer to 14 hands. He's really wide. Um, he, if people didn't know that he's Icelandic, they think he was a halflinger. Um, and he's like a goofball. Like he eats the lead rope. He's really forward. He can have a little bit of a scoot every once in a while if he gets nervous by something. So he definitely needs a kid that can tolerate that. And that's okay with that. And, you know, I have good handlers and I know they could work with that. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely based upon what the kid's physical needs are, emotional needs are. Um, and as well as, you know, I pretty much try to stick with the same horses with the kids, but like, I will like change up, you know, horses here and there, to see what's the best fit, plus juggling all their schedules um, and so forth. Um, and then again, I have that Connemara, I'm not Connemara, the um, Chinkatee Pony I would use. Um, and we did some more groundwork with her. So if I have kids that we are doing, um, we I have her, um, she knows a lot more of like, I wouldn't say it's just, not it's more of the natural horsemanship but not really it's just like good good like, good lunging skills but like yeah. on a smaller circle type of thing and it's a lot based upon body awareness and coordination and so like all of my kids that i'm working on increasing their body awareness and so forth will use her um for like body placement because she'll get like to stop dead and turn in if you like don't you can't keep your body moving through space so we'll use kind of her so it's just there's so many options and so many things to think about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like even with just the four, right? I can't, yeah. you know, I can't even imagine. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's funny because uh, again, you know, I'm curious the uh, at the therapeutic riding, there were, you know, there were definitely riders who they would gravitate to a certain horse and they wanted to ride it. You know, they were like, I want that one, you know, because of the way the horse looked or whatever or the name. Yeah. Um, you know, so how do you deal with that situation where? You know, they clearly want to do this and that's yeah. not on the plan, right? So I think I have, I mean, of my clients, because I have a lot of kids that have a lot of involved needs and differences, maybe three or four can communicate that to me out of the okay. 20. Um, I do have a bunch of communication devices and they will ask, you know, for different horses and so forth. But usually it's just a conversation. Like, so like the Chingatee Pony we're using, like, you know, we're just decide she's not appropriate for me to have kids on her back just because it was unfair to my leaders because she was nippy. So it's just not um, fair to someone to come out and be nipped. The whole nipped time. Yeah. So it was just the reality of like, I have to also be, even though she's great with the kids on her back, I have to be fair to my horse leaders because they're mostly volunteers. So it's, you know, they have to enjoy their time as well. Right. Um, 
So I had one that was like really, really upset that, you know, when she was going to come back after this whole COVID and being at telehealth sessions and so forth, that she was not going to get to, you know, I, I warned her that, you know, she might be transitioning away from her when this first started um, in March. Um, but what I did is because I had the ability, you know, of seeing these kids in all other environments that like I, every week we discussed it, um, weeks coming up to, I sent her a video of the new horse she was going to be riding. Um, we talked about why she was going to be riding him so forth. And then the minute she got on him, she like fell in love with him. And then mm. that was it. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, really cool. And then how do the, how do, how does the family rate? So I'm, I'm sure that a lot of these children, their families are not, not coming from horse families, right? Or horse backgrounds. So, you know, I mean, like what? It, yeah, it depends. I mean, I think in New Hampshire, it's very different than some other places. True, true. Uh, yeah. I think in like when I was in New York or when I was down North Carolina, like, yeah, there weren't a lot. But surprisingly here, I think half the families are gravitating because they've had horses in the past or their kids love horses. And so they think, you know, they're like, this is a great way that they can do therapy because they haven't been successful in other environments. Um, my families that have not had horse experience are gravitated towards it just because of a lot of the research that's coming out about it, supporting it for a variety of different diagnoses and just hearing, you know, from word of mouth and so forth. And, you know, I don't think any of them are scared per se, because they all love, they all love coming. So oh, I, think yeah. just, um, I think it's just people just depends on the situation. So. Yeah. And then you mentioned, right, because of COVID, you were, um, you were actually having the families do the same thing. Is there, what do you notice the difference about that? I mean, is that, you know, it, having the family involved in, in, in the hippotherapy versus having uh, somebody else involved with that, where you say the parents or the family is observing, like what, yeah. do you so notice anything I mean, different? I think the big thing for me is my practice has always been really family centered. So mm -hmm. like when we're at home, like as much as possible, if I'm doing home visits or out in the community, like I'm coaching the families on how to do things. Um, I think what I do with a lot of my families, COVID or not, is in the beginning, I typically have my, have a leader, have myself sidewalking, have someone else on the side sidewalking. If the parents don't have horse experience, if they're interested in training, I will train them. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of the time I'd be like kind of screaming over the fence, like kind of telling them this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, or have them come in the arena and kind of just stay with us. And I think it was a good realization that like, I, as long as the families, obviously there's, but some have a lot of kids, so it's not possible. But, right. um, but I think the families are now enjoying sidewalking. And I think it was a good realization that like, I'm using them the whole session anyway. Like, let me just train them how to be around the horses if they haven't been around the horses. Um, because a lot of the hands-on pieces that they were learning when we were doing telehealth, they're like, oh, well, what can we try this on the horse? And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. Like, exactly. Let's do that. So I think it's been a good realization for the families that like, this is definitely a good way to be still involved. Um, yeah. And yeah. they can participate more deeply. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so I'm sure that's really, um, it actually adds another layer, like a good layer with, uh, with the child as well. Right. Yes with the involvement there. Now what happens? Cause you, you said, yeah, you know, Hampshire and I know like there's a lot of horses and people have horses, but um, this is obviously something you're not going to like go home and, you know, do this with old Dobbin. Right. So yeah. this is, like, you know, you don't, you don't have a session with you and then say, let's go get our, you know, our pony and horse all, all set up to do that. Yeah. But, you know, do you encounter that situation at all? Or, you know, I, high horse people. Maybe had one family that had, a horse at home and they're like, yeah, he's not appropriate. Like, <laughs> that was like a lot of my families that do have horses. They're like, Oh, we threw her on or him on when he was little, but like, we really didn't know what we were doing. And like, and a lot of my families are just like, now nah, we'll just wait to do it. You know, I have a few kids though, that interesting enough, like their needs are like, they're, I don't like to use, I won't actually, I'll, the better way to describe it is that they, they're, you know, some of their diagnoses are, are kind of indistinguishable from their peers and there's some okay. underlying needs, whether it's visual, social, emotional, so forth. So they come to me and they work on their therapy goals on the horse, but they also go once, twice a week. One of them even leases a pony and just rides, you know, 
regularly the rest of the week. And that's where I think it's really cool because it's really showing you the difference is that when they're coming to me, it's not right. You know, it's not writing. We're really yeah. working on, we're doing our therapy and they could, you know, they could still go, you know, if it's appropriate with writing lessons or the family or so forth, they could still ride, but they're not going to be doing therapy per se. Right. Um, like a kid can go to a therapist and do aquatic therapy and then they can go later swimming at the friend's house type of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I think the thing that's really in kind of, um, is important too, is that like, you know, the horse is just, I hate to use the word, the t- a tool or modality, but you know, cause they are a living being, but the horse is being used as a treatment approach to kind of work on goals. So when I send the kids home and they have like homework or follow-up activities, it's going to be off the horse because that's where your daily routine is. The horse is just being used to then better promote those skills off the horse. And it's kind of to amplify that experience while, while it's there. So, um, so the horse itself though, you know, you said that they, oh, they kind of, they love it. Right. So do you, do you see a different affect, you know, where they really want to take care of the kids or they're maybe, you know, really being more watchful or moving different, like how involved they get with you. you It depends on the horse. So like this, this appendix I use is always been wild for his owner. And the minute (laughs) you bring kids around, he's like totally different. Like he is just like, I mean, he could have like a kid screaming on his back and is like totally fine. But if his owner rides him and his best buddy girlfriend is not in the arena he's screaming his head off yet we have a kid on him he doesn't pay attention to that mare so it's just like um and he's just like literally just butters him up like he like once the kids are off he's like in their face wanting scratches um one of my other ones hersters like that as well whereas um the other Icelandic is like cool that was cool but I'm really like my own independent guy um so it just depends on the horse. Um, they all seem to really enjoy it, though. Um, they all like kids. That's why, you know, they're a good fit. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, I noticed, um, I mean, even, you know, I don't have a therapy horse or anything, but I notice even my own horse when there's littler kids or non-horse people around that she's much more careful with them. Uh, you know, and you can, you can definitely feel like that different, that different energy there, um, between, you know, between that and what, and what I get <laughs> normally. Yeah, so yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty yeah. Unusual. I mean, if I bring my daughter around, I could pretty much plop her on most horses, even if I ride them and they're super hot headed, you put her on them and they're, I mean, of course she's being held and the horse is being led, but you know, right. they're like, oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what about as far as, so we talked about therapeutic writing and you have hypotherapy and you mentioned that some of, some of your patients or your clients do ride during the week. I mean, is that something, you know, let's say, you know, I'm, you know, I have a child, I'm a client of yours and I have the financial means or the availability. I mean, is that something that you would recommend as, you know, not, not necessarily OT, yeah. but like a continuation of, you know, goodness. I don't even recommend, I mean, it's usually not even recommended. It's just the kids say like, I really like being around the horses and the parents are like, all right, we'll sign you up for riding lessons type of thing. Like I got sign my kid up for like softball or swimming lessons or, you know, something right. like that. And these kids that are going for riding lessons that are seeing me for therapy are not going to a therapeutic riding center. They are actually going to like some little barn down the road and they're just taking, you know, lessons. I mean, these kids, you know, again, are a lot, you know, less, you know, they're not as distinguishable from their peers. So going there, people gotcha, won't quite gotcha. realize that like there are things we're working on, you know, there may not be motor things they're working on. There might be more like sensory or, you know, so forth. But I've had some kids that like do have some more significant motor challenges and we've done therapy for a while and we've kind of gone to the maximum that their body's physically going to be able to do. For example, I had one kid that had cerebral palsy and had like, it was impacting her left side. So, you know, she wasn't going to ever fully functionally, you know, I said function. she had full capacity at what she could to use her left hand and her left leg. Obviously it was not the same as her right leg, her right arm and her right leg. Um, but at that point I was like, you can do all your daily activities. You have adaptations to do what you need to do. And she loved horses. So what did she do? She went down, down the road. This is a while ago when I was in North Carolina, she went down the road and she found a dressage trainer at that point. You know, I mean, I was riding professionally at the time too, but I was like, I don't have horses for you. Like go, go to my friend. She has great horses. And then she started doing some of the paradressage tests. 
you know, because she was like, I was like, you can do everything pretty much. There's going to be a difference. I mean, riding's not going to be the same, you know, as, as, you know, it's a little bit different, but go ride the dressage trainer. She'll help you. And that's what she did. So. Wow. That is really cool though. That's yeah. such a, that's such a neat story. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about the kids, but I want to ask you what, like, what got you, I mean, obviously you mentioned you've, you've ridden professionally and you've, um, you know, you and I have chatted before you rode in, in college and right, yeah. you've lifelong writers. So is this, this choice of hippotherapy to do this, was this just kind of a natural extension of having horses in your life all your life or, or yeah, what, what so brought you to that? <laughs> it's a really interesting story. So um, obviously like most people, when I was in college, I just wasn't sure where I wanted to go. Um, my grandfather actually was one of the first OTs in the U S um, he graduated from NYU right after World War II, after he fought in World War II. So, like, I always had an interest in being an OT. Um, when I was younger, like, in my late teens, I actually used to uh, lead in sidewalk in OTPT and speak sessions and incorporate hippotherapy. Um, I used to actually teach some of the therapeutic riding, um, and that's how I kind of pushed away from more of that because I was not – I didn't like how there was a blur of the line, so I started doing more um, – teaching more power dressage at that point because I was really interested in that transition piece. Um, sorry, that's my dog's tail thumping. I, I, I was going to ask because I'm like, that sounds <laughs> – I'm like, I think I know what that is. <laughs> sorry, yeah, that's okay. Part. Um, <laughs> everyone else is out of the house but all the animals except for the dog and the people oh no uh, that's fine so um so I um I went to I uh, actually went to Mount Holy for my undergrad and I <laughs> <laughs> didn't wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do I was a neuroscience and behavior major um and I thought, I would, oh, well, I'll go to, I was like, I don't want to be a doctor. So like, oh, I'll go to vet school. And then I realized like, no, I definitely don't want to go to vet school. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I, I'm glad I didn't make that choice. Um, and, um, and then I was like, oh, I'll get into research, so forth. And I was like, I don't want to be sitting in front in, in a lab the rest of my life. So, um, I was like, I used to volunteer doing all this stuff in the past. Like, why don't I just go to OT school? Um, and I ended up going to Washington University in St. Louis because the professor, Dr. Timothy Shirtliff there, did, was doing a lot of research on hippotherapy with kids with uh, cerebral palsy, like huge research studies. So I went along and I was like, oh, I'm going to go do, you go there, I'll do a research study and so forth. And that's where I ended up doing our research study we had on uh, using um, OT incorporated hippotherapy for kids with autism. So, wow. Uh, so that's, that was kind of the path. Plus, I mean, um, I think it's really great for people that have a horse background. Um, it, it definitely helps if you come from like, especially a dressage or like a, a reigning background. Um, I think from those perspectives of the English and the Western world, because you really understand like the horse's gait and their movement. A lot of it is focused on the principles of, you know, good forward, you know, good movement related to dressage and as well as a reigning world. Um, so, um, interesting enough, older dressage horses that are obviously not too huge and older reigning horses make some really good horses too. Um, so yeah, I think it just kind of, it just, it just all came it. together and yeah. you're so lucky to really, in, in some ways be able to have your passions be part of your vocation as well, where, yeah. you oh, know, yeah. to really have that come through is, is, is really, really cool. It's really nice. Yeah. Especially, you know, being able to be around you know horses throughout the day and outside throughout the day and it's kind of really nice yeah so i mean you know you I, i'm going to key in on a little comment you made though you know you wrote a lot and, and you were a competitive writer um and i think you'd mentioned you were professional at some point so is that a little bittersweet for you or is that kind of just an end of an era right you know um, you're on to better I mean, things it's hard because yeah. I mean, I, you know, decided I wanted to have a family and so forth. So like, I sold my really nice dressage horse that I brought up and I, you know, I do a lot of bringing young horses up and, you know, getting them, you know, I did a lot of, lots of trainings of young horses for other people and then they got sold a lot. So, but I think, um, I do hope to be able to still work up the levels and, you know, finish off my medals at some point, <laughs> but, um, but I think, you know, I'm very fortunate that like I've met some people in the area and I think it's people need to realize is that like you can still ride a lot even when you have you know 
even when you're doing a different career. Because now, like, obviously, I don't have my own horse anymore, but, like, I've made connections that I'm actually, like, riding a friend's horse now. And then, you know, I still get to do some cool mid-level work and bring him up the levels, you know. So I still get those opportunities, but I don't have to be doing it seven, you know, six, seven days a week. Right. It's hard when I'm working full time and have a family. So like I still get to ride this really super cool, you know, Dutch cross horse, like, you know, three, four times a week. And I know like the other days of the week that they're doing other fun things with him. And so it's still possible. Yeah. Yeah. You still kind of have one hand in the game a little bit. You keep yeah. it in warm. <laughs> yeah. Keeping it warm keep on the side. Yeah. 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 So so another um you know, I'm just thinking as we're talking here. Um I know that there's a lot of people out there that I, I think are horse people and, you know, but they, they, you know, this whole thing with the, the equine therapy in so many different ways has exploded. So if somebody wanted to volunteer, right. So let's say that, um, you know, they wanted to help out. You mentioned you had like a volunteer program or how, you know, how do these people find you to be, you know, trained as your leaders and then or how do you find them or how does that work exactly? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing too also is for, you know, what I'm trying to be really upfront with people is like what I'm doing because I think people get confused because everyone's like, oh, equine therapy, like what, what is equine therapy? And that's where it comes to confusion too right, because yeah. From my opinion, it's like, oh, equine therapy. Oh, my horse has an injury. I'm going to go get my equine some therapy. Oh, you know? awesome therapy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, because right. there actually are, like, big centers around the country that are yes. like equine therapy, a.k.a. your horse needs rehab, <laughs> so, you yes. know, for a suspensory or whatever, so forth. Um, and I think the terminology makes it confusing because people will come to me and be like, wait, what do you do? Like, what are we doing? Um, so that's why a lot of times people, I try to say like, oh, you know, we're doing equine assisted therapy or we're doing adaptive riding or so forth. Um, but I think people come to me cause you know, I think I pretty much, I know a lot of the big programs that are more so programs, the terms being for ones that are more riding centers, they call themselves programs. Um, and they have a lot of outreach and they get a lot of volunteers that way because they're all non-for-profit based. Um, so it's very easy for them to get, you know, volunteers and, and so forth. Whereas I'm running a solo, pra you know, clinic and a practice myself. So a lot of my horse leaders, I end up just getting either from word or mouth. Um, and funny enough, social media. Um, really? I, I post a lot on the local, um, which has become now as an adult, I realize, is there's called town groups. So each town has their own Facebook page. <laughs> so um, I just post on the surrounding radius area that I'm looking for um, experienced horse leaders. Um, and a lot of, I get a lot of high schoolers because it's a great opportunity for community service based that way. Um, mm -hmm. as well as, um, I also get a lot of adults that have had horses in the past, but no longer can do it financially or don't have the time and so forth. So like they'll do it when their kids are, or well, were in school. <laughs> um, and then also I get a lot of retirees that are looking for some, horse experience again and a lot of them have even have their own horses but their horses are retired so they're looking for ways to kind of just interact a little bit more nice so. and that gives you a nice mix too and I think for the kids right you know yeah. so you have a you have a good you good spread and then um going all the way back full circle right so you talked about insurance and um you know hippotherapy uh how so you know, insurance is, I, I don't want to go on a rant about healthcare, but insurance is so hard to get things reimbursed. Yeah. And this, you know, I, this just seems, you know, how, how do you know the history or you have a point of view on how it is that now that's becoming more mainstream where insurance will pay for that as a. So, the thing is, is like, and this is where the confusion, cause I don't want to go into whole billing and coding and so forth. No, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I just to give a kind of overview is there is some confusion insurance companies, like there's regular codes for billing and because it's an OT session, I just use regular OT codes. So, but okay. the thing is to be careful, I try to be careful is, is like, I try to lead with the therapy versus the horse. So we are doing OT and I know it's a mouthful, but we are doing OT, we incorporate hippotherapy, not like we are coming for hippotherapy, if that makes sense. No, because that totally makes sense. Yes. Some people yeah. be like, oh, well, according to our document, like hippotherapy slash 
therapeutic riding is a specific code and that's not therapy that's a, not a stand that's you're seeing as a standalone they call it service so we're not going to pay for it which is just a misconception so that's where when i call insurance companies i'm pretty much like okay like i'm an ot like i'm a network with you like what are your exclusions for treatment they'll send me their exclusions and only one insurance company that I, that I try to work with blatantly says they don't cover it. So I don't take that insurance because I'm not dealing with that. But, and I'd be like, okay, well, I use horses. They say, okay. I said, and they go to me, are you using, like, are you teaching the kids to ride? I'm like, nope, we're doing hippotherapy using the equine movement. And I say, we use it for only part of the session. We have regular, it's the same thing as a regular session. We just use the horse for the part of it. Just like it uses, I mean, I hate to say it, but like, just like you use a swing or a ball or so forth. I mean, I know there's so many other better factors than the social oh, emotion and so forth, but yeah. insurance companies, you have to just say it's like another piece of equipment, which is brutal, but, yeah. um, but they were like, oh, okay. So as long as I use my, all my regular codings and the thing that is hard is just insurance have caps on limits for some kids. So, and then I'm just fine. And more, it's more of what I would do, whether a kid's seen on the horse or not on the horse in their home or so forth. It's the same thing, just fighting for like number of visits and so forth versus, you know, I'm fortunate that in New Hampshire, especially the insurance companies are very open to it. Um, so. Yeah. And that's a really good point about, you know, you're leading with a the therapy and the horse is, you know, a part of that therapeutic plan. Yes. Right, versus oh i'm i'm the horse's therapeutic and and i can see where that you know because you think about things like massage right you know we didn't used to have massage paid for um but it's the same thing it has to be part of a ther like a physical therapy plan versus yes. you know oh, i'm going to the massage therapist because yes. it makes me feel good you know yes. and they don't want to pay for that so yeah no that's i was just you know curious about that because of, you know, when, when we talk about hypotherapy or some of these, you know, I, I think sometimes people think that's not quote mainstream or it's experimental and, you know, you're, you're actually going in with a clinical plan. This is the therapy, right? Just like I would go to the physical and therapist. And that's why it, people yeah. think it's experimental because it's not a standalone service. It's not like I, yeah. I'm not a hypotherapist, I'm not, right. you know, I'm <laughs> yeah. an OT. Yeah. Like, especially like if I was like using like a dog in my session, I'm not a dog therapist. Like I, I'm like dog something his tail. He actually is a retired therapy dog, but like we would use him as part of our session, but I wouldn't say we were doing like, oh, let's come for dog therapy. You know, it's like, oh, we're going to yeah. come for OT and cool you know my dog's going to be here for part of the session so we can work on some of our goals so yeah and i was going to ask you you know horses versus dogs right you know um you know as far as the ot are there uh, are there um occupational therapists who use other kinds of animals right yes, maybe absolutely. not a horse yeah so yeah. i mean the, the the benefit of the horse obviously is the movement piece right which i don't think we talked a ton about i was now i'm just realizing i think like, we really didn't talk about that movement piece a lot <laughs> but just to kind of give a bit of an overview is like I mean, I'm obviously going to be talking to a lot of horse people, but the horse obviously has a three-dimensional gait. So they move forward, backward, side to side, and then they have the rotation of the pelvis. Plus, you actually think about it, you have two other dimensional pieces. The horse is moving up and down, and then they're moving like this way. Mm. There's pieces. So you're getting all those movement pieces, which you can't replicate, um, obviously, on anything else. I mean, yeah, they make horse simulators, but still you're missing some of those movement through, the, through space piece. Um, and all the sensory experience and all the social emotional pieces, like all that you cannot replicate. Um, so it impacts the whole, you know, nervous system, it impacts the whole sensory system. It's a lot of kids is helping like integrate and organize their systems, like kids with autism, you bring them to like a sensory gym and you use swings and equipment and send and use the horse for that. Um, and then with, um, you know, with, um, kids with more motor needs, you're working, you're using the movement to work on the balance and the coordination and so forth. Um, so that's kind of just like that whole piece with that. And now I went on a tangent can, and I totally lost it. Oh, no, no, because we were talking about dogs and other animals. Okay, and yeah, I, and exactly. I'm really glad that you brought that up because yeah. I, I, yeah, I completely missed the motor piece too, but that totally makes sense, right? Yeah. Because somebody would argue, well, you know, why don't you just use a mechanical horse? But yeah you know, there's just so much richness with like a real living being, yeah. right? That's helping. But yeah, no. And we were talking about, yeah, dogs or- Exactly, I mean, yeah. yeah. That, does, that does bridge my point because- Exactly. The <laughs> so like, obviously with the horses too, like if I'm using the horse on the ground too, 
Um, I do a lot with my, obviously on the ground piece, like I help kids, but we'll be brushing the horse. And I put that in quotations because we're not learning to brush the horse. We're brushing the horse. So like I might put them on an unsteady surface. Like I might even be, you know, not, I might even take a, a, a water bucket and flip it upside down and it's kind of unsteady and we'll work on a kid that has like say they their right hand is a little bit weaker we'll work on reaching and brushing and it's a lot more fun than like painting or like other activities um you know i have kids that i was saying before we'll kind of do some obstacle courses um on the ground with the horse that they visually set it up and move the horse through it and plan um and there's some balance things that they have to walk over while they do i mean a horse is obviously really good about it um, once in a while, even this is where people get confused that I'll put the reins on the horse and it's not for teach them how to learn to ride the horse. It's right. to teach them how to like coordinate arm movement and eye movement and figure out planning and, or they'll have to communicate to the leader, which way to turn and so forth. So there's a whole, you know, different piece in there. Whereas if I bring my dog in and we use a dog in the session, we might be working on more especially because a dog you can snuggle up with and, you know, a little bit more than a horse, just from safety yeah. perspective. <laughs> um, we could work on some more of those social emotional pieces. We could work on some back and forth, you know, with the fetch. We could work on, you know, again, though, if I wanted to work on a kid using hand strength, we could work on brushing the dog, um, right. so forth. Um, a lot of people just will use different animals. I mean, we have like ducks and chickens and so forth. And it's more of just like, um, just, you know, I use them more for the kids about, we just, you know, it's just, they're there part of the session. I know I have a friend who's a speech therapist and it's a great language opportunity a lot to be talking and communicating about real life things in front of you versus like sitting at a desk and looking at pictures and talking about it. Um, but I mean, it just depends on what you want to use, you know, those various animals for. I mean, I had one facility, they had goats. And I had a kid that just, for some reason, I have to say for some reason, she just really liked goats. So she would completely lighten up and I was able to actually like, get her engaging and communicating more. So we did our session in the goat pen when we were off the horse. So it just kind of just depends on what the kind of the kids needs and so forth are. Um, yeah. And it sounds like you're also observing on where that those kind of facilitate them being more open or, you know, more, more into what you're doing yes. um, in, in the session. So yeah. Wow. Wow. It's really, really, it's, it's just really, really interesting. And, um, you know, I learned a lot because I, I, I'll admit, and I think a lot of people get confused about this, right. You know, that the hippotherapy, I mean, therapeutic riding now I get it right. And you yeah. know, the therapeutic riding place I was, uh, I was volunteering at, they actually had a horse show. <laughs> so yeah, that's exactly. like not, right? that's not therapy, yeah. right. Yeah. You know, and but that's I, I, yeah. confusing. And that's why I yeah. like use, you know, the horse definitely does have, and the using the word therapeutic is hard because therapeutic is actually a billable code under by a therapist. So mm. a horse does have a positive impact on everybody. There's no denial. Like there's no denial that sitting on a horse, like for a kid that has, some motor challenges, just sitting on the horse and getting the input is beneficial. But then adding a therapist to the equation who's trained and he knows how to make an impact to communicate to the horse leader on how to change the horse's gait to meet the child's need and how to then communicate, you know, facilitate the child with specific strategies to hold on to them and, you know, or provide support to their body should they hold on to provide support and so forth kind of impacts that as well. So well, yeah, and it sounds like you, you know, and I'm I'm probably oversimplifying uh, this, and I, okay. I apologize, but you right where you're you're doing therapeutic right, you're riding and you're getting you're getting something from the horse, right? Whether or not it's moving my hips or whatever, but it's not. Or even social too. Or even so, social, yeah. yeah. I mean, because um, when I was volunteering, there was a woman there that she. Yeah, she had um, a lot of, uh, you know, social, you know, communication and things. But I mean, it was just amazing to see how much she lit up just being on the horse. Yeah. And she started talking to me yeah. and she never talks, right? And we would have these conversations for 45 minutes and, you know, um, and, and I got as much out of it as I'm sure, you know, she did and everybody else. But the, but I think it sounds like the biggest difference is that you, the the horse is there to facilitate a very specific goal or a movement, right? Where mm -hmm. I'm going to be coordinating or I'm planning or I'm moving in this way, right? I'm yeah. working on this thing. 
where the horse is there, like, you know, we use the word tool, but the horse is there to partly facilitate that yeah. as part of that therapy versus I'm riding and I'm learning how to ride and I'm getting some goodness out of it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a side benefit. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Even though it kind of looks the same, right. Where, you know, you've got the sidewalkers and the leader and, you know, and, and except you've got another person called a therapist. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's, uh, that's been, um, no, this was really, really illuminating for me and I'm sure for, for a lot of other people um, as well. So Heather, I'm going to ask you, ask all my guests, yeah. um, what, what, like you've been with horses for pretty much all your life, but what was your aha moment that you would want to share with the audience regarding your, your journey with horses? I think it's just to realize that like, and I know it's hard for a lot of people, is that like, horses will always be there in some form of capacity so like it, it can be hard like it was really hard for me when I had to you know step away as like a professional I wasn't, wasn't even a professional at that point but step away from my own personal horses um you know it was a tough decision and I think people realize that like life happens and things happen whether financially it's hard at that time you have a family you have a job so forth but there's always a way that you can do horses and I think it's you know I've been very fortunate that I've been able to find other means to be able to ride, but I think also being able to have horses in part of my practice, um, just seeing that the positive benefits that it has on my clients and even some of my horse leaders getting that opportunity for them to get out and about, I think just, and even my families, I think it's just great to see all the differences it makes. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're special, aren't they? Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. they have their own special magic. Well, Dr. Heather, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, for everybody else, thank you. And uh, if you want more information uh, about what Heather does, and you've mentioned Heather, you're on social media yeah. uh, and some of the research and some of the things that she's publishing, we'll have that in the show notes. So this has been another episode of Under the Forelock. Thank you so much.